Lisa, with tear-filled eyes, gently stroked her still flat stomach as she said, I'm pregnant with John's child, so Karen should divorce him. It's too sad for a child to grow up without a father, don't you think? Her words were directed at me while Elisa's parents glared in my direction. As John's childhood friend and ex-girlfriend, Lisa had surprised me many times before, but this time I was truly and deeply disheartened. You see, my name is Karen, and I had a happy marriage with John. I speak of it in the past tense, because John is no longer with us. He left the house one morning with a smile, saying, I'm off, but tragically, he never returned the same. John had passed away suddenly from an illness, leaving me heartbroken. Before John's untimely death, we had just begun to settle into a peaceful married life. However, our relationship had been complicated by John's overbearing mother and Lisa, his persistent ex-girlfriend. Since John's passing, I've had little contact with my mother-in-law, who was always selfish and controlling, determined to direct John's life as she pleased. For many years, John's mother saw Lisa as the ideal match for her son, almost like a daughter-in-law chosen by both sets of parents. In fact, they were led to believe they were a couple as children and even thought they were romantically involved until middle school. But when John reached his teenage years, he realized the absurdity of the arrangement. He gently explained to Lisa that their supposed engagement was not normal, and though he moved on, Lisa never did. John was handsome and smart, though admittedly not athletic, which oddly enough made him even more attractive. After breaking up with Lisa, he had other girlfriends, but she refused to let go. Whenever John dated someone new, Lisa would appear during their dates, recounting their childhood memories together. No girlfriend would feel comfortable hearing stories of their first kiss in kindergarten or how their parents had essentially planned their engagement. As a result, many of John's relationships ended because of Lisa's interference, or so I'd heard. By the time I met John, we were both working adults, and I, too, became a target of Lisa's antics. Although her behavior was bothersome, I had no intention of breaking up with John. He truly cherished me, and I felt the same way about him. Our relationship was built on love and mutual respect, and I believed Lisa had no place in it. When John once apologized for Lisa's behavior, looking regretful, I told him, don't worry about it, let's get some ice cream, I'm hungry, he was so relieved, and later, he told me that was the moment he knew he wanted to marry me. We eventually decided to get married, but my mother-in-law and Lisa teamed up to try and stop us. Lisa came from a wealthy family and it seemed that my mother-in-law had hoped John would marry her to benefit financially, since Lisa was eager to marry John. Their goals aligned perfectly. When I would visit my in-laws to pay my respects, I faced constant harassment. Once, despite knowing in advance that I would be visiting, my mother-in-law invited Lisa over for a tea party. My father-in-law tried to intervene, telling my mother-in-law that enough was enough, but she was far too domineering for him to make any real impact. Whenever he tried to object, she'd brush him off saying, Lisa is like a daughter to us, it's fine, defeated, he would fall silent. Lisa was familiar with all of John's previous girlfriends, so she took particular pleasure in mocking me, positioning me as the least attractive. She would say things like, John didn't marry for looks but for personality, but I can't believe Karen's such an amazing person. Her sarcastic remark made my mother-in-law laugh, and it created even more tension. John, however, was furious. He confronted both his mother and Lisa, yelling, don't ever get involved with Karen again. Then he took me away from his family's house. He apologized repeatedly and went so far as to refuse to invite his mother to our wedding. Naturally, Lisa wasn't invited either, which infuriated both of them. In retaliation, my mother-in-law and Lisa decided to visit our new home when John wasn't around. John had already told me that I didn't need to interact with them, so when I saw them on the security camera, I asked them to leave but they refused, ringing the doorbell and making a scene, to avoid drawing attention from the neighbors. I reluctantly opened the door. They barged in, immediately criticizing the interior of our home. Lisa called the indirect lighting, which John had carefully chosen, tacky, but when I mentioned that John had selected it, she quickly changed her tone, saying, that's so John, I actually think it's a nice design, making her insincerity all the more obvious. Despite them arriving uninvited, I served snacks and tea because they complained of being hungry. My mother-in-law scolded me for not offering homemade treats, and Lisa griped that the tea was bitter. After they had their fill of complaining, they left just before John returned home. Exhausted, I fell asleep on the sofa, and when I woke up, I found that John had gently covered me with a blanket. I told him everything that had happened, and he was livid. 
He immediately called both his family and Lisa to confront them, but his family showed no signs of regret, and Lisa, far from feeling chastised, was delighted to hear from John after such a long time. I realized that no matter what we said to my mother-in-law or Lisa, it wouldn't make a difference. After talking it over with John, we decided that if they showed up again, we wouldn't open the door and would call the police if they caused a scene. If they still refused to leave, we planned to seek further help from the authorities. It was really difficult when my mother-in-law and Lisa did show up, and we had to call the police. However, after being scolded by the officers, they finally stopped coming to our house, though it was tough. I thought we could finally live in peace, but then, out of nowhere, John passed away suddenly. At the funeral, I was in shock, clinging to the coffin and crying. My mother-in-law cruelly blamed me, saying that I had stressed John out, leading to his death. If my parents hadn't stood up for me, I don't know how I would have made it through. I expected Lisa to attend the funeral, but she didn't. Even now, I shudder to think what might have happened if she had teamed up with my mother-in-law to accuse me. Three years have passed since John's death, and I still live in the house we shared, though it's painful. I can't bring myself to leave the place filled with memories of him. One day, as I was enjoying a quiet moment, the doorbell rang. I checked the monitor and saw Lisa, along with two people who looked like her parents. Lisa was smiling, but her parents wore serious expressions. Curious, I decided to let them in, since John's death anniversary was approaching. I opened the door, not realizing it was a mistake. Long time no see, Karen, Lisa said, I'm pregnant with John's child, so you need to divorce him. It's not right for a child to grow up without a father, don't you think? She caressed her flat stomach, her eyes filling with tears. I was shocked. I had been caught off guard by Lisa before, but this time I was completely speechless. John had passed away. And yet she was saying this? As I tried to make sense of her words, her parents stepped forward, raising their voices. Even though John was married, he got Lisa pregnant. He needs to take responsibility, they shouted. You can't expect Lisa to raise this child alone. As the three of them made a scene at my door, I felt a cold chill run down my spine. Even after John's death, Lisa continued to torment him. John had always been kind, but Lisa caused him so much stress during his life. I couldn't forgive her, with that thought. I invited them inside, saying it wasn't good to keep standing at the entrance. I led them into the living room, where our family portraits were displayed. Lisa's parents entered first and were shocked when they saw the portraits. Lisa followed, her eyes widening and her voice catching in her throat when she spotted John's picture. While they were still processing what they saw, I calmly unfolded a table, served tea, and sat down. So, Lisa, you're pregnant with John's child, huh? John passed away three years ago. I'd love to know how you managed to get pregnant with my late husband's child, I said, pretending to be concerned. Are you feeling okay? You look a little pale. Lisa's face turned white, her voice trembling as she muttered, that, that can't be true, but before she could react further, her parents stepped in. Her father immediately knelt down in apology, followed by her mother. He grabbed Lisa's arm, forcing her to bow as well. We're so sorry, her father said. We didn't know John had passed away. As Lisa broke into tears, her father grabbed her by the collar and shouted, Who's the father of the child you're carrying? That's when Lisa started to confess her wrongdoings. The reason Lisa had stopped coming to our house wasn't because she had given up, but because she had been transferred for work. It turned out that neither Lisa's nor John's parents had been in contact, so they truly didn't know John had passed away. As for the baby Lisa claimed to be carrying, it was unclear who the father was. It could have been her married boss or one of the men she met at bars. Lisa had been living such a chaotic life that it was impossible to determine who the father was. Even though she had feelings for John, she had tried to tear us apart by lying and saying the child was his, thinking John wouldn't abandon her now that she was going to be a single mother. Upon hearing Lisa's confession, her mother started crying, and her father called her behavior shameful. I calmly asked Lisa, How many months pregnant are you? Uh, oh, um, three months. The baby is already kicking, she stammered. You usually don't feel the baby move until at least four months. Are you sure there's really a baby? I asked, giving her a cold stare. Lisa trembled and eventually admitted, There's no baby. I love John. I really do. As she rambled on, her mother began smacking her on the back, and her father, now in tears, deeply bowed to me and said, We will come back another day to apologize. Then they left. As they departed, I told them, No need for further apologies. Just don't come back again. After they hurried away, I lit a candle at the home altar and prayed. 
I spoke to John, thanking him for giving me strength. Normally, I'm not one to argue or stand my ground, but somehow I managed to handle the situation calmly, just like John would have. He was always good at keeping his cool during conflicts. It felt like John was with me that day, guiding me. I cried for the first time in a long while, realizing just how much I missed him. The house felt unbearably empty without him. A few days later, despite my request for them not to return, Lisa's parents came back. I didn't want them in the house full of memories of John, so I agreed to meet them at a nearby restaurant. After paying my respects to John at the altar, I went to the restaurant. Lisa's parents were waiting for me, looking pale. We deeply apologize for our rudeness the other day. We are truly ashamed of our daughter. Lisa's father began. Apparently, after hearing about John's death, Lisa had a breakdown, crying uncontrollably. In her delusion, she somehow convinced herself that I was responsible for John's death and wanted to confront me. Her parents, thankfully, took her to a hospital instead. Lisa was diagnosed with a severe mental illness, which caused her to hurt others to get what she wanted. She would be undergoing therapy and counseling moving forward. Lisa had quit her job, believing she was going to marry John, and now would have to face the reality of her situation while receiving treatment. Her parents, despite their wealth, seemed quite old and worried about taking care of her. They handed me an envelope of cash as an apology for the trouble. I didn't even bother to open it. I don't need this money. All I want is to never deal with you or Lisa again. Maybe you could use it to move somewhere far away so we don't cross paths. I replied with a bit of sarcasm. They solemnly agreed, saying they would move. Later, I received a letter confirming they had relocated far away, along with more money, which I rejected again. Looking at their new address, it seemed they had moved quite far. Now, I knew Lisa would never be part of my life again. Speaking to John's photo on the anniversary of his death, I said, Our marriage faced many challenges, but I cherished every moment with you. My life with you was a happy one. Thank you. From now on, I plan to live my life alone, cherishing the joys John never got to experience, and when I eventually join him in heaven, I'll have plenty to tell him about.